Hello everybody and welcome back to the car show season. This time it is 2024. We are back in the saddle again. A little bit late, I'm not going to lie. Totally didn't have a bunch of footage ready and I procrastinated and I sat on it so long and the next car show showed up so why not just combine them into one? That didn't happen and it's not going to cause any continuity errors. But the point is, we are back with car shows in 2024. So let's have a bit of fun with them, shall we? And we start out with the Swedes! The Swedes had a great appearance. Not only were there plenty of estate cars, but they were pretty good estate cars. See, both the Volvo V70R was in attendance, and the V60R with the little blue badge indicating that it was a Polestar variant, which they only made a few hundred of, if I'm correct in my recollection. So, very nice to see fast Swedish estate cars, but even better to see fast Swedish 90s boxy sedans in the form of the 850T5R in its, shall we say, interesting yellow paint. But even better than that is the full-bore Volvo 850R. Yes, it's the R variant, not the T5R, the real deal. It's a beautiful masterpiece. It's a shame it's not the estate car, but seeing an 850R will always put a smile on my face, especially as we move into the Italian show, which again, had a phenomenal attendance. Hell's by having two car shows combined into one, but that's not the point. The point is, we got to see plenty of classic sports cars like the 2000 Fiat over there, or the new Puro Sangue, which I don't like the fact that Ferrari has an SUV, but if you're going to make a Ferrari SUV, at least give it a thumping great V12. And no, I'm not going to let them forget that they sued a charity to get that name. That's just scummy. But moving on, it's something more optimistic. It's a Ferrari 812 Superfast in British Racing Green. A color combination I didn't think would work, but hey, I'm not going to complain. It actually looks kind of nice. And especially, though, Ferraris should be red. Whether it be the 488 Pista, the 246 Dino, they should always be red. Except for this one, which should be white because it's a Testarossa and that's Miami Vice. But seeing one of the original Testarossas with the funky mirrors is... It's this beautiful car. Not as beautiful as this, though. Not gonna lie, I thought this was a 288 GTO for a hot second, but it's just a 308 GTB. Regardless of how happy I was for half a second, it's still a stunning early 80s Ferrari. Magnificent vehicle. Even if it got overshadowed by Lamborghini because they brought a Huracan Strada with the awesome paint job on it. It is Lamborghini's job to upstage Ferrari, what can I say? But Lamborghini got upstaged when Porsche showed up with a 911 Dakar with a tent on it. It had a tent. <laughs> That's so bizarre to see an off-road 911 with a tent on it. But I can't help but love it for its ridiculousness. Especially because it's not the only rally spec 911 that we saw today. This is a 944 Turbo Rally car. Which is always... I love seeing weird rally cars. This is a recurring theme in this episode. A very rally-focused episode, as it turns out. But let's get away from the dirt for a second and focus on the more tarmac-orientated cars. Like the 914-6 and the 928 S4 that we saw earlier. Not quite the fastest 928. That goes to the, the GTB. But seeing these classic Porsches is always a welcome sight. Especially if they have a whale tail. Because whale tails are just cool. And the GT representation was in good hands with the GT3 RS and 991.2, was it? Or this fantastic electric blue 718 GT4. And if you want something a little bit more interesting, you can go with the Kubelwagen, or sorry, the Thing. It's the Thing. A pre-merger AMG Mercedes. So this is before Mercedes bought a majority stake in the company. Or, more significantly... An Audi or Quattro, the first four-wheel drive rally car. Nice to see it again. It's a staple, and for good reason. This is not lovely to see, though. These cars, while very impressive, are very hideous, and yet BMW managed to make them even more hideous. I mean, really, who thought orange highlights on a green and black paint job with that grill 
would be a good thing, but I guess it's a fast car, the M3 CS. But my god, is that front end hideous. Especially when we got a Golf livery M3 GT2 style thing. It looks amazing, or even better than the E92 M3. We got a 525i. Ugh, it infuriates me that BMW are so bad now, but let's just move on to the Japanese because we got a crazy wing on this SUV and more reliable SUVs and wonderful cars that don't look awful. Like the Toyota Celica Supra. Back when the Supra was still tied to the Celica brand. Before it split off as the Toyota Supra did its own thing and the Celica did this. Yes, this is an actual right-hand drive, not modified, GT4 homologation special for the World Rally Championship. And it looks kind of amazing. I just wish it had the massive rear wing from the famed rally cars that Carlos Sainz drove. Wonderful. Again, not really an... It's a notch back, so I can't say it's the Jade, the initial D car, but still an A86 is quite nice. And we got two different versions of MX-5. Another weird rally car, because it's just filled with that this episode, and a crazy wide-body time attack thing with the chassis-mounted rear wing. In fact, I think there is a Miata attached to that wing somewhere, but the wing is so big I'm having trouble finding it. And JDM cars, once again, kind of stole the show because right-hand drive, proper Japanese domestic market vehicles are always a win in my book. You don't see them too often. They're quite rare. And although I quite like modified rally cars made out of 280Zs that look like they went through hell, there is something intangible about having those mint condition unmodified legends in attendance many of them were nissan gtrs we had the r32 of both stock guys and crazy tuned up mines guys mental machines like what 500 wheel horsepower something like that or even more so R33 GTR V-Specs, it's not quite Midnight Purple, but it's pretty close, and a wonderful R34 with the worst rims I think I've ever seen. They don't match the color, and they certainly don't match what a beautiful R34 that is. Ugh. So close, and yet so far, which is why I'm focusing on the Nissan EXA Sportback. It's a convertible with a shooting brake hatchback on the back. It's super funky looking, it's super weird. I absolutely love it. And it has the most 90s taillights I think I've ever seen. It's a wonderfully wacky vehicle and it's probably my favorite of the entire as two shows. And yet amazingly, that's not even the peak for most people. I like weird cars, so it's my favorite, but others will have their opinions because the Fast and the Furious was in full effect, not just with Vince's Maxima, not just with Brian's Eclipse, but with Monica and the Integra. <laughs> Although I think this Integra is substantially better than the Fast and Furious Integra, because again, unmodified, incredibly valuable JDM imports are always a win in my book, especially if it is an Integra Type R. And we'll come back to Fast and Furious, don't worry, there's another one coming up, it's just not in the Japanese branch. And Honda stepped it up as well, not with the Integras, but with the N600. All 32 horsepower of the little K car, 0-60, to 60, 28 seconds. I'm actually kind of amazed it can hit 60, it sounds terrifying in that small of a vehicle. And yet, just had to show up with a JDM... Impreza WRX Type RA homologation special for the World Rally Championship. It's even more special than the Celica from earlier. And then Mitsubishi showed up and was like, no, 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 no. We see your rally cars, but what about a rally van with a martini livery and a bull bar? That's amazing. <laughs> a martini livery four-wheel drive rally van with a, a massive bull bar. <laughs> The boulevard does not match the van size. It's weird, but I love it. It's beautiful. Speaking of beautiful, we move on to the British. British roadsters, classic British cars, just in general. They really scream sleek, professional, stylish, small, 
like the mini here, but it's kind of cute. But if you want cuteness, the mini milk has them beat because it looks like a Barbie car. I've never seen that color blue and that white in that small of a vehicle. It's kind of adorable, actually. It is kind of adorable, even if it looks a little childish to some. What's not childish is the Aston Martin DB12. It looks very similar to DB11, but God, is that that is not an insult. The DB12 is a phenomenal looking car. It's also supremely comfortable, having gotten to sit in it. Very comfortable, actually. Not quite Rolls Royce, but not bad at all. And then we have the low tie. And te like, technically, this is a Catrum, but it's really a Lotus 7 at heart. This is one of the early Catrums, and they still have the Lotus badging on them from the early 80s. This is much more Lotus in that sense. The famous Elise in proper purple and gold, as it, sh I think, as it should be. Really, should be British racing green, but I'm not going to complain because we have both the Avora and the new Amira, which looks amazing. It's like a Maserati MC20, but affordable and probably better in pretty much every way. What I did not expect to see was the racing version. I didn't even think the Amira GT4 was out yet, much less in the U.S., but seeing it in the flesh with a 007 paint job, of all things, was a very welcoming surprise. And it wasn't the only British track car on display. A Radical, while not very fast, missing his rear wing, was in the shop and still could probably beat pretty much everything on that course, except for maybe the Amira GT4. But it's time to finish off with America. And America had quite possibly the most diverse group of cars I've ever seen. We have the old cars from 1910s and 1920s. There's a Willis here. We got a yellow cab back when it was made by the yellow cab car company and not just modified normal cars. Very, it's probably 100 years old. That car must, it's pretty close. They were built between 1923 and 1927, so it's pretty darn close to 100 years old, if not 101, and it's still on the road. That is an incredible achievement. And there was many individual manufacturers, like the Falcon F7 here, or the Studebakers, a huge cavalcade of different brands in attendance. And I always like to see that. I like seeing different cars. As much as I like the Viper ACR, the Dart GT, you see them quite a few times. But seeing a, a Falcon F7, one of only seven ever built, now that's pretty unique. Also unique is the Forts, a body kit that I didn't think was a real thing, necessary to house the largest supercharger I've ever seen. Yeah, that's a Forza car in real life, and I can't help but admire the lunacy of a wide-body supercharged ATSV. But it's always the classics, it's always the muscle cars that are going to get the most attention. We had the El Camino SS396, wish it was a 454 because massive engine is always good. Hennessy actually showed up with a uh, HPE 475 tuned up Camaro. I'm surprised they were able to deliver it. On a different side, we have a Geo Metro with four wheels and a Porsche badge. I'm not even sure it would be worth the copyright infringement to mess with the Geo Metro convertible. But this is quite special. This is a custom-built... It's, it's only, they only made a few of them. It's a LS-swapped mid-engine Ariel Atom type thing. It was, America, it was America's take on an Ariel Atom. And it never really got off the ground because it came into production right as the financial crisis hit, but it looks super funky, it's super cool, and it's got a massive Corvette engine in it. Yeah, it's probably a death trap. I told you I'd get back to Fast and Furious. We got a um, F-150 Lightning, Brian's truck from the uh, first film. It's seen better days, but I'll give them credit where it's due to actually have something different from the Fast and Furious films. It wasn't just a JDM car. And in fact, there were plenty of Fords in attendance, ranging from the Thunderbird to the Model T. <laughs> there were also British um, Fords. We had a Ford Cortina estate car, which I didn't even think they sold the Cortina in the U.S. And we had the Escort GT here. So lots of vehicles from Britain sent here to America, either through 
the gray market, or through badge engineering, like this Ford Mercury Capri, which looks astonishing. I love the look of the Mark I Capri. Seeing Britain's Mustang in the flesh is always nice to see. But sometimes you just gotta look at the American Mustang and say that's probably better, because V8 engines are cool, and Mr. Chrome is even better. I tried to get a... I see the color change paint by swapping. You can kind of see the color change. It's not a brilliant angle. But still, there were plenty of unique builds. Whether it be a Time Attack car or a full-blown IMSA GT4 race car. Yeah, thank God we are at a racetrack because it lets you see all of these weird and wonderful vehicles that are definitely not road legal and cannot go to any other con cars and coffee or concourse or anything like that. Like a Devon with an IndyCar engine in it from Offenhauser. Or a Super Light Series special thing, which is a dirt racer that looks like it weighs about a thousand pounds. That is a tiny BMW next to them, and it makes this car look massive. I love this show. It had everything that I wanted and so much more. I didn't expect to see a mid-engine Corvette wannabe Ariel Adam monstrosity. I didn't expect to see a dozen or so rally cars from every nationality that didn't even make sense. But hopefully, since this is just the start of the season, things are only going to get better, and that is a very bold statement.